A while ago I left some comments on a video about some guy who was accosted while dressed up as Zombie Muhammad, I believe. The Zombie Prophet Muhammad. And um, some of those comments got replies and one of those was from a fellow named Banana Dude 1000 who asked, plus why don't you believe in a religion? Don't you wonder how things came to be? Or where you go when you die. Now, I think I've answered the second part, where do you go when you die, a couple of times, and I have a, another video where I've specifically addressed what I think about that. But um, I want to do it again because it's a question that keeps coming up. It's a question that's often asked not really as a question, but as a sales pitch kind of thing. It's the, it's the salesman's gambit. They start off with, have you thought about what happens to you when you die? And hopefully the answer is no, because if the answer is no, that means, right, I can sell you a load of horse shit then, because you haven't already got your own ideas about it. And once I do manage to sell you that horse shit, I can sell you the rest of my program, which is, you know, you're going to not die, you're going to live forever, but, but, you're going to live forever only in a nice way if you follow my program and do everything I say. And if you don't, then you're going to go to this horrible place, this horrible place. And depending on the religion, you know, they'll have different lead characters. And the one that, of course, we have to deal with mostly out here in the Christian West is Christianity, where they have uh, the good guy, that's the shepherd, Jesus Christ. And then if you don't follow the rules, you get the bad guy will come after you, that's Satan. So, so Jesus is the shepherd and Satan is the sheepdog. But it all depends upon you buying that first part where you haven't actually thought about what happens to you when you die, so you get to just be sold someone else's theory. But if you do think about what happens to you when you die, if you actually think about it, then I think it leads you down another path. And once you have thought about it, you are sort of immunized against all those other religious ideas. The answer to the question, what happens to you when you die, depends upon the answer to the question, what is you? From infancy, we start to explore and find out that there is an interface between that which we directly control and that which we have to act upon. And we find that the interface is our skin. On this side of our skin is you, and on that side of the skin is the universe. We identify with our bodies. Later, as our intellectual life becomes more complicated, we start identifying with our memories, and with our ideas and thoughts, with our personality. And when we look at a dead body, we can see that a person is much more than just their body. It's very natural to look at a corpse and say, the person is gone. We start to develop this idea of a duality, the mind-body duality, as though they are two different things, because they feel like two different things. Where did the dancing go? And where did the music go? The dancer is not the dance, and the music box is not the music. Certainly, encoded in there is the way to make music, but it's not the music. And if I smashed this to pieces, there wouldn't even be that. Where did the music go? I could show you the internal cogs and wheels and sprockets of the music box, but you wouldn't see music in there because music isn't what the music box machinery is, it's what the music box machinery does. Music is the verb to the music box's noun. Similarly, I could show you a human being's body and you wouldn't see the personality, you wouldn't see the you in it, because the you is not what the body is, but what the body does. It's what the body creates. Music is a sequence of events in time, and you are a sequence of experiences and thoughts and a piling up of memories in time. So what of the position that says that this metaphor is being overstretched, that this analogy is being worked too hard. Consciousness is such a complicated phenomenon, more so than music, that it can't possibly be explained by the workings of a mere mechanism. There must be something more. What about spirit or soul? 
Well, how can we determine this? Let's try, let's try by chopping away at the mechanism and see what it can support and what it can't. So let's cut off an arm, for example. If we do that, can we still touch things? Can we still sense the temperature of a surface or the roughness or smoothness of a surface with a spirit arm? Does a spirit arm take over the job that our regular arm was doing? No. And of course, lots of people would say it'd be silly to expect such a thing. Cut your legs off. Will you get spirit legs to hover your body around? I don't think so. Oh, you say, well, your body's physical and you need physical legs for your spirit to act through because your spirit is just spiritual. And what about phantom limb pain and amputees? Isn't that evidence for a spiritual body? No. What about quadriplegics, for example? They have all their limbs and yet they sometimes suffer from phantom limb pain or they can feel like their limbs are in positions that their limbs are not in. And the spirit still cannot use those limbs to walk around or to grasp things even though they're physically there. It seems that the spirit is unable to do anything without the presence of intact nerve tissue. Now think about the implications of that when you ponder the largest bundle of nerves in your body. Your brain. We've learned a lot about the brain over the years, mostly by studying what happens when bits of it stop working, through accidents or strokes for example. If you lose your visual cortex at the back of your head, you won't be seeing anything. Your spirit won't see either. If you lose Broca's area or Wernicke's area, you won't be able to understand speech. You'll have difficulty producing language other people can understand either. If you lose your hippocampus, well, you won't be forming any new memories. You won't be recalling old ones either. Consciousness seems to be more of a distributed phenomenon, but we have ways of messing with that. We have chemicals called anaesthetics, for example. Why, you put someone under anaesthetics and they won't know the difference between a second, a minute, a year, or an eternity. So if your brain dies, you won't have any of those services your brain does for you. And if there is a spirit, it's blind, it's deaf. It can't speak, it can't understand language. It isn't conscious, it doesn't have thoughts, it doesn't have memories. It doesn't even have emotions. Without a brain to do all those things for it, if there is a spirit, it has nothing. Which is why some Eastern mystics spend an inordinate amount of time trying to let go of all those things that we normally think of as self. Because if there is any kind of divine spark that survives death, it's absolutely nothing to do with anything that we consider ourselves. So just to sum up, in case you haven't got the point yet, what happens to you after you die? Nothing. Nothing happens to you after you die, because you aren't there. <laughs>